While at the Gothenburg Botanical Gardens, I became enamored with their subalpine and alpine house, which was designed and built in 1981. I got to see a lot of new plants that are accustomed to these unique growing conditions. The substrate the plants grow on is made of tufa, which is a porous limestone that you could find throughout the southwestern United States, around the southwestern coastline of Western Australia, parts of South Africa, and a few other places throughout the world. Because of its unique composition and structure, it provides vital habitat for a diverse array of plants, which we'll see shortly. Most of the plants here are high alpines, or alpines, uh, in need of a, of a very well-drained uh, situation. Quite a lot of them we have tried growing in our alpine house, mm -hmm. but then they sit in pots. We have an alpine collection, and then it's, they're growing in pots. Uh, so th that's a sort of collection, uh, and that is not open to the public. Uh, and then um, to, to try and see if, if, if they would work, if, if they would grow for us out here, we take cuttings from the alpine house and, and plant them out here uh, to see if they can grow in these tufa stones. They seem like they're growing pretty well. Some of them, yeah. some of them not happy. Yeah. <laughs> well, this looks like the, the stone to me at first looked like coral, and then it looks very calcareous. Yeah. Is, that, is that kind of what the composition of these stones it's, are? It's alkaline. Alkaline, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like limestone-ish or... Yes, yeah. and this is, this is something that grows in, in um, certain kinds of bogs, mm -hmm. yeah, bogs lakes. Bogs, yeah. So it's, it's something you sort of harvest, mm -hmm. it grows. So it's not, a, it's not a volcanic stone. Oh, interesting. So this is a very porous kind of stone. Um, and it's uh, uh, quite often that the quarries are protected. Um, this, uh, from on the table here, this stone came from Wales in the beginning of the 80s. And this came from Central Europe mm -hmm. in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, as we're going to, we, we're discussing now building new greenhouses, mm -hmm. and this is this is a this kind of planting is, is very very popular. So we want to do a really a new one, a really big one. So we sort of started discussing where 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 can you get hold of tufa at the moment mm -hmm. because that varies depending on where you get permission to quarry. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I heard from some enthusiasts this spring was Albania. Hmm. Uh, Czech Republic, various places in Eastern Eastern Europe. Uh, it's it's expensive, and and you're recommended to go to go to the quarries and actually point. I want this stone, hmm. and then you have to uh, pay a lot of money and bring it home with you. And it's it's a very attractive way of displaying the plants. And this is this is what they what they grow like in nature. So can you take us a little bit through some of these plants? Because this is actually the first time that I'm seeing so many of these species. Mm. And that really excites me because, you know, it is an unusual way to kind of see. I, I think this is probably my favorite room within the Botanic Gardens. And so if you could take us maybe a little bit through some species that you might like or that you think are interesting, yeah. um, I think uh, we would love that. Well, as you see, most of the, most of the plants here are cushions. And that, of course, is, a, is an adaptation to a very tough alpine environment with strong winds, high light levels, big differences between uh, night and day uh, as far as temperature is concerned. And, of course, very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter and, and a lot of snow. So almost like lichen, like if you would see lichen growing on stones, like yeah. they have to re have yeah. the same type of... You know, well, a lot of conditions. alpines are, are adopted, adopted to this kind of environment. And Cushion shape because if because it's so strong, such strong winds. If you have big leaves and, and the wind starts to flop around, you, you damage the the plant. So they're tight. Quite often they have silvery leaves because the the light levels are so high. Uh, quite often they have showy flowers because there are few pollinators in these areas. So they actually have to show. Here I am, come this way. Um, so a lot of a lot of cushion plants, uh, and, and those are the high, high alpines. And that is, of course, um, Androsace, Andravas, Saxifragas. Um, so this is a Saxifraga yeah. right here. Yeah. And it's really beautiful. I mean, if you look at the rosettes, they're just so yeah. stunning. This is Idriantus. 
This means it's, it's fairly newly planted out. It will have its proper label. With the blue tag yeah. then, yeah. yeah. So these are, all, these are all cushion. This is phlox. This is an American. Oh yeah, phlox, of yeah. course. And they usually do have really beautiful, colorful flowers. Yes. Yeah. But uh, um, even if, I mean, they are, they are cushions, but you can, it's, it's difficult to create um, in a, an environment, particularly with, a, with a sufficient light levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, the that's the most difficult bit. So we have this quite old-fashioned, high-pressure sodium uh, lights. Gives up a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough light. So we have new, in the Dionysia collection, we have LEDs mm -hmm. with a very blue, a lot of um, blue light in it, which they like. So, so they like that high, high yeah. like ultraviolet. So, so the the, the, the cushions spectrum. here, they could be much tighter. Mm -hmm. So in, in nature, they are much tighter than they are here. It's... Uh, I mean, it's all right, but it, it could be better. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, oftentimes I come into botanic gardens and I'm like, why is that not a house plant yet? Because that's really cool. And some of the things that you're mentioning here is, one, it likes a little bit more on the bluer end of the spectrum, which is a little bit more of that ultraviolet, you know, intense kind of light um, in order to be able to grow very compact. And we're also in a room uh, that's a little chilly right now. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that it a little bit too chilly for comfort, you know, in a home. So yes, this definitely. Would be, this would be a difficult, these would all be difficult yes, plants to, to grow. Definitely. Um, they, they would all hate it because it's too hot, hot. it's too too dry. I mean, the, these plants are uh, very sensitive to uh, like mildew mm -hmm. and, and mold. Mm -hmm. So of course it has to be very, very good circulation. So we have uh, these two, two fans. Uh, and, and we always have the side vents mm -hmm. and the, the vents in the roof wide open. So we, we try to keep this house as cold as possible, but not below zero. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these plants, they would all hate being indoors. Too hot, too dry, too dark. Just not good at all. Really good knowledge. So it dashes the hopes of many of our houseplant owners, but it doesn't mean that we can't appreciate no. you know, these plants. And now some of them you had mentioned that are cushions, but you see some of these that you're growing here that seem, um, you know, that are kind of you know, growing in a slightly, slightly differently and are a little bit more leafier varieties. Any I think it's because uh, we're also special about growing plants in a, in a landscape like this or outside in a rock garden is that you, have, you get all these microclimates. You can, you can like, like here, this is growing. That, that's, that's south. Mm -hmm. So this is growing in this uh, crevice here, facing north. Mm -hmm. and, and as you water up here, the water will round down. So this is always shaded. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and this sits in a, of course these stones are set in sand. Uh, and and this, this table is quite deep. So it's, they, they sit in sand. So uh, the sand is wet, it soaks up the, the moisture. So this plant here, which is a fern, uh, it's always, uh, in the shade, it's always moist, and still it's just next to these plants growing up here, which is always ex um, exposed to the light, and, and it's, it, it dries out extremely quickly. So there's a lot of nuance I see here in the plantings, and of course you have a lot of surface area that you're working with with these stones, but everything seems to be intentionally planted as you pointed out in the fern. Yeah. So we, we, we drill out these holes and we plant uh, fairly newly rooted cuttings. But we also tried uh, sowing directly because that, that's usually much better. You can, you can be quite generous with seeds, you, you put them out in various places. So the, the establishing of the plants is much easier if, if they are sown directly where they should grow. So you have to spend much more time uh, looking after them, a bit of watering maybe in the beginning maybe twice a day with those with the blue that are newly planted. Should we walk down here and actually yeah. see some other varieties? Quite a lot of uh, corridolis, which is a specialty for this garden. Uh, people, botanists have been working on corridolis for the last 40, 50 years. Is it something that, um, I'm, not, I'm unfamiliar with it, but is it something that is um, economically important? or no. Okay, no. so it's just interesting. Yeah. And what are the aspects that make it interesting? 
Oh, uh, it's it's the ble uh, it's the um, the bleeding heart oh, family. Oh, the bleeding hearts. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, but you, I mean, you get so many different plants. Yeah. yeah, and you, you, it could be bleeding hearts. It could be we have uh, corundulus from the desert. Okay. That have um, uh, tuber make tubers. Yes. Uh, adopted to that. We have woodland corundulus, corundulus scoliari. It's an American, for example, this high mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, has grown all all over. Mm -hmm large portion of the, the American part of the rock garden. So um, Kurudalis is a, a big thing in yeah. this garden. We have a couple um, plants that are called bleeding hearts and one of our other genuses, either genera, is called Dicentra. Yeah, I don't yeah. Think I, I don't uh, think that's the same. same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's it's got that beautiful blue prodigious yeah, yeah. hue, which again probably is a, a protection from harsh sun. Yeah. This one's neat. It almost looks like um, like an evergreen in a way, like yeah. little little pine cones or whatnot. I also have a chrysum coraludus mm -hmm. from uh, 1978. This has wow. been growing here for a long time. Wow. But probably before this, because this was created in 1981. Yeah, so you've had that. You can, if you look at the labels, mm -hmm. uh, it says here uh, 1978 3832. Mm -hmm. It came into the garden in 1978 and it was put into the database as the 3,832nd no, 3, plant wow. in the database that year. And this is the, the um, donor, Ingvarsen, mm -hmm. and that's name. And you can see this as PG. Mm -hmm. P means plant, it came as a plant. Mm -hmm. G means it came, the, 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 the plant came from a garden. You could also say SW in which case it, it was a seed collected in the wild. Hmm. So if you, if you look at these uh, labels, you can, you can work out quite a lot, you can get quite a lot of information. Yeah, just from looking at that yeah. without having the pre previous information. Yeah. And this one's pretty interesting back there. Well, we don't like it, but we it's, uh, it's uh, botanically, this is a bit of a, uh, Henrik, our um, horticultural curator, he brought this, this is Peonia Californica. Uh, it's a, it's quite tall, it's about 60 centimeters, and it has a small, very small, uh, sort of brown, reddish uh, peony flower. Do you think it just doesn't fit within the collection? No, I think it's, it's, too, it's too big, it's too yeah. leafy. Yeah. I'd like to see, but he, I mean, this, the, it likes it here, so yeah. I mean, why not? It's very special, it's very unusual, and he's very happy with it. Well, you can't, I guess you can't deny where it grows the best, you know? No, no. It's, it's like a weed in our garden, you know, that's where it wants to grow. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We didn't expect it to do as well, but it's, this is now 12 years old. Wow. And that was seed collected in the wild yes, in America. Yeah. yeah. And, and here's, an, here's another yeah. Cordelis. It's a lovely smell. Yeah, and it has, um, it has some, a really... Ooh, Beautiful that scent. is really nice. Yes, yeah. And that flowers all winter. Wow. That's it, fantastic. It's almost like... Um, it's not... It has a little essence of jasmine, but it's a little yeah. bit muskier yeah. than that. You know, it has... Um, Oh, or like clover, it clover, clover. Yeah, a little clover, yeah, yeah. Clover, little clover in there as well. And they, of course, they set seeds all the time. They have this sneaky habit of, <laughs> like all dicentras, no? No, quite often the, the trick with, with collecting these seeds is that uh, they look as if they're green and far from being ripe, and then suddenly they're gone, they're out all over the place. Yeah. So if you want to collect seeds, you have to get them to, before, yeah. just as you have them. Yeah. But they, 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 they turn up everywhere. Yeah. yeah, so you have to constantly pick them out. Yeah, that's, that's another nice thing with this grow with sand and tufa is that things tend to see themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and if you clue up and aware of what you're doing, if you're lucky, they will place themselves in the, in the optimal place. Some of them, of course, they're, they're just too many. <laughs> now these are cute too. You have a couple of these in bloom. Yeah, that's Dionysia. Um, that's another specialty. Uh, as far as I understand, the largest collection of Dionysius in the world that was started here in 1965 wow. by the, um, by the uh, director of the garden, Per van der uh, he, he, he wrote his thesis on Dionysia and he started the collection. And where would you actually see Dionysia primarily? In the wild. In the wild, yeah. yeah that's uh, mainly in Iran. In Iran, in Iran. Yeah, okay. and, and, and Afghanistan. So, 
two countries that are sometimes a little bit more challenging now to probably get plants yeah. from. So well, nobody's been to Afghanistan since 1979. Yeah. yeah. So we, th there are there are some Afghan species, and of course, uh, no new genetic material has been added or has been brought into cultivation for decades. So the fact that you even have this collection is, you know, is phenomenal because you, you know, might not have or be able to get a collection like this again for at least a, a quite a bit of time. No, no, and they're also threatened by, by global warming. Mm -hmm. The, the Dionysias in Iran, um, because they, they also grow in, in the rocks, uh, and, and it's very, 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 very dry in the summer. Uh, and it's, they are dependent on, uh, on the snow. So in these mountain areas, mountainous areas, you get a lot of snow, the snow melts, then they go into flower, mm -hmm. and, and um, they sort of live off that, the, the moisture that the melted snow adds to the rock. Mm -hmm. And then you get these very, very dry summers, and then they sort of have a, a little rest. And then when it gets cooler, towards the autumn, they start growing again. <coughs> But the thing is that they get less and less precipitation, less snow, less rain. Summer starts uh, earlier and ends later, so they dry out. Yeah. So they try and, and uh, they're not very mobile. We can look at our collection later, but they're, the, the, where, the, where they grow is very, very special. So they're not that mobile. Uh, so they are stuck at a level where, they, where it's too dry and too hot. And they, a lot of them are are only found, have only been found on one rock. They're endemic to one rock. Wow. So that if they is. if they die out there, well then that's it. So this is a this is an in an ex situ collection uh, where we are trying to preserve them here in Sweden, which is a bit absurd. Yeah. Iran has no um, conservation work on them. Uh, but we have been growing them for nearly fifty years. Uh, so, you can, I mean, it's conservation in a way. It's turned out to be like that, that they are threatened by, by global warming. You know, the botanical garden, there's this discussion that it should serve as somewhat conservation, mm. but sometimes you think conservation makes sense within the area that you're in. Yeah, yeah. But so many of our botanical gardens have become this ex situ, ex -situ conservation, yeah. just because, as you're saying, it doesn't exist in these countries. Oh. But it is quite absurd because you need multiples of those species in order to be able to, you know, I would imagine cross-pollinate and, mm. and have enough biodiversity and genetic material for them to survive. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what we're doing. That's what I started uh, working on when I took over the collection of dinosaurs in 2008. If you have, like a lot of primulas, you have to have a, it's two different kinds oh. of, of styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be able like, to cross-pollinate okay. within a species, yes. you have to have one of each. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are very few clones in cultivation uh, for some of these species, but uh, where there were two, uh, one brevistil, or one, I don't know what the English word is. We could get it afterwards. Yeah, brevistil, longistil. When, when I was able to get hold of both, mm -hmm. I cross-pollinated, and that meant I could get new genetic material without going to Afghanistan. So, but, but some of the Afghan uh, species there is only one clone in cultivation, mm -hmm. and you can't you can't self you say selfish self pollinate. Self, so you can't self pollinate. Yeah, yeah. It, it has it, it has needs to happened. Cross -pollinate. Yeah, yeah, it has happened. Mm -hmm. That has been successful anyway, but uh, usually not. Yeah. Well, we, I'd love to go see the the Dionysus collection yeah. afterwards, but let's maybe go through a couple more. Like this one is interesting. It kind of reminds me of hops for whatever reason. The flower. This <laughs> like is a kind little, of oregano. Yeah. And uh, I think this is, this is um now the. Somebody's been scraping the label, but it's uh, <laughs> this is uh, um, it's uh, very popular in the Mediterranean for stomach problems. Mm. So you, you make a kind of tea. It's very so it's very like pretty, pretty and they yeah, lovely. Really oregano, or it, oregano does smell. Does it smell? Yeah. Oh yeah, it does smell a little bit like that. Very very handsome. Yeah, it's it's pretty all year round. Very nice herb. Well, I'd imagine then it, it would be similar to like a rosemary if it's like from a uh, Mediterranean area. Does mm. it grow like a rosemary? And no, it doesn't. Uh, this is a this is a hybrid. Okay. Uh, so this is this is a very 
odd way of growing. This is actually <laughs> sitting in the rocks. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think uh, rosemaries and, and, and sages and things, yeah. thymes, do that in the same yeah, way. Yeah, no, I, and this one's extremely just, woody, actually. Yeah. Pretty impressive. I mean, you look at this. You can see it's stem. Oh, yeah. This is, I, I, it's lost its, um, I, can't, I can't see how old it is. Yeah, it is. But that's, uh, that's an old one. Yeah. Wow. A lot of these plants are very. This is a uh, erodium, mm -hmm. uh, geranium, from Greece. Beautiful. Another. They're very, very old. Yeah. I mean, plants like this, uh, they don't get this old or large in nature. So this is, in a way, a bit weird. You have it good, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and then a lot of primulas, of course, primula alione. Yeah, that's something you know, that you, you very often see in in. Um, Arrangements like this, rock gardens, troughs, or tufa stones. One of the things that really struck me is this tree, which is from America. Yeah. Not anything in my neck of the woods, but it's got this like silvery golden hue. And when you look up, it looks like little popcorn chunks hanging from the tree. It's so yeah, cool. It has, it has little yellow flowers mm -hmm. in the spring. I don't know much about this tree. Shepherd, yeah, Rotondifolia. And according to Henrik, this is the largest specimen in cultivation of this tree. Wow. Uh, it, it grows really well. As you can see, we have been forced to prune it quite violently. <laughs> yes. It doesn't really like it. Oh, that's such a shame. It's, uh, it's very... When you prune it, you, this, fl this flower comes off it, which makes you cough. It's, and people get allergic to it. It it's, uh, makes you very itchy. So it doesn't want to be pruned at all? It's no, it doesn't. It, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to prune in, in an attractive way. And, and what are, what are what these that? called? It, it looks as if uh, if it was on the ground, yeah. it would root. It would root, like aerial maybe roots coming maybe out of just, it. Uh, maybe it's not a tree. Maybe it's uh, sort of shrubs that sort of spread. Yeah, it's interesting, like, like a rhizomatous, rhizomatous um, uh, stems. Very it unique. Sounds, uh, Never seen that. Well, I've been touching it a lot, so hopefully the um, the leaves and um, since it's not in flower, hopefully the leaves are not going to start itching and making me cough. Uh, it, it could be if you because this is it's very loose. It's yeah. like a fine powder. It is. It is. I imagine if you start to actually breathe that mm. in. We always have a, a breathing a mask, mask when we uh, prune it. It does bend back and to be touched, um, you know, because it is it has all this texture yeah. that you typically wouldn't see. Yeah. You have a couple other. Um, textural ones like this one um i heard your colleague say it was new but it's, that's it's just newly planted out so we'll have to see what, what happens to that yeah beautiful plant yeah you know it has this like downy kind of look to it yeah. but and you have of course more more of the uh these the those are self-seeded they yeah. just uh, <laughs> sort of move around i don't know who somebody moves them around i don't i have not this ants or what it is but yeah. these things turn up and this one has a nice little waterfall of uh yeah, that's asparula. This is covered in, this is, this is sort of little late flowering, but this is absolutely covered in these sweet scented flowers in the autumn. And then of course uh, Daphne works very well in the tufa. And some really big uh, primula hybrids. And you see this, this wall here, everything is, this is all self-seeded. You almost don't need a gardener. <laughs> no, and, and the gardener has to be very aware yeah. of what he or she does. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that, that, that's true of also in the outside in the in the rock garden. You have to be very aware of self-seeded things. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to actually go see some of your Dionysus collection because yeah. if that is something that's really unique and obviously not something that we'll be getting to see anytime soon due to reasons that you had mentioned yeah. so if you're open to it we'd love to yeah. see it. Is just the other room. Perfect. Tell me what you thought of the travertine plants in the comments below and if you're digging all these new species give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to show your support and if you find yourself watching this channel often consider becoming a sustaining member. The majority of these videos are not sponsored so we rely on viewer support for all this botanical goodness. And if you want to dig deeper into the world of houseplants, then be sure to check out the Houseplant Masterclass, which is a month-long audiovisual course on houseplant care, cultivation, and more at houseplantmasterclass.com.